Hello and welcome to Bowl with the Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And I'm Jenna. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. Huh? <laughs> what was that last name that was just said? Oh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> welcome back jenna thanks thanks for having me <laughs> well it's been quite a while it's been since phil collins since you've been on the show and you know what what you missed i'll fill you in on what you missed in the rest of season two since since the last episode you were in was phil the shill what you've missed is that phil collins was in every single episode after that right john yes he he, he won't go away he's hovering <laughs> around my music how dare you not tell me you robbed me of a whole half season of Phil? <laughs> oh, not you, just that. You, you you also missed out on the baby tub. I yeah, know. Tubbs Jr. I just thought about I was thinking <laughs> and, that and, you didn't know about baby tubs. Like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I mean, we can get it. I have concerns, you guys. I have some real concerns about the new look this season. But just before that, are we talking like Tubbs is a baby or that Tubbs has a baby. Jenna he has a baby and we can't find baby. it. So we've got it on a milk carton. <laughs> uh, we've been putting up wanted posters. Tubbs baby. <laughs> Just Tubbs baby. Tubbs Jr. It was Tubbs Jr. We use this baby. <laughs> Does anyone speak Jamaican? Because I feel like that might be the way to find this. <laughs> well, we're going to skip the our normal section where we check in with each other's lives because we're just happy that jenna came on we are happy to have a new perspective as we begin this is season three episode one titled when irish eyes are crying it originally premiered on september 26 1986 it is written by john leakley but it was also the teleplay was written by dick wolf and leakley so and what's the trend here is that dick wolf will be either the writer or the teleplay writer for 80% of the episodes in season three. So the stark story changes, he's involved in almost every single one of them. They also gave him a producer credit. He's... I think that comes with a parking space. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, you will also, because you are a big fan of this episode. Yes. And there's no coincidence that you're a fan of this episode because the writer, John Leakley, also wrote the episode Bushido. Which is my one of my favorites. Yep. <laughs> and I guess it remember you're like, well, guess what other episode he wrote? I'm like, I already know. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you information that you've probably already told me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Unfortunately. <This is> not- <laughs> Mansplaining with go with the heat. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, Melissa, Castillo does not drop down from the ceiling and samurai anyone. I know. And he looks, can we talk about how he looks a little bit older? Yes. He's a little bit grayer. I mean, not that saying it's bad on him, but you We're going to come back to that because I have an opinion on where we're going with season three. I have a change in my opinion since we've seen this episode. The director of this episode is Mario DeLeo. He will also direct one more episode titled The Good Caller, which I didn't bother to look up what season that airs in. But he will be back. And like I mentioned, we're going to skip what's going on in each other's lives because we're going to welcome Jenna. Welcome back to Go With The Heat. <laughs> and we are welcoming season three of Miami Vice in a big way. So let's go talk about our opening. So we open up and we're at a presentation, a very strong PowerPoint presentation being made by none other than Liam Neeson of all guest stars right out of the gate, which... In reality, as I read about the episode, this was actually supposed to be episode six, but they swapped them in the airing and they decided to go with this one first. So there will be some continuity stuff that we'll run into later in the season <laughs> where like the Ferrari <laughs> makes a magic comeback in episode six. Whoops. It's not that Ferrari. It's a different Ferrari. That type of stuff doesn't matter. <laughs> and joining Liam Neeson is Gina, who's in the crowd, who's staring at Liam while Dreamweaver should have been playing as she (laughs) stares at him. Oh, yeah. She likes what he's saying. She likes it a lot. (laughs) And also the principal from The Breakfast Club. He doesn't have a name. He's just the principal. (laughs) Just the principal from The Breakfast Club. See, and I thought because of him, like I thought they were actually out of high school. (laughs) Uh, Like, oh, my God, everyone's in detention. This sucks. (laughs) So Liam Neeson is up there. We find out later that his name is, his last name is Karun, and he is our central plot point in this episode. He is giving a speech about how the English have responded to the IRA and the provosts and other militant groups in Ireland. He's talking about how the violence must end. 
But Gina's not hearing none of that. All she's hearing is, I wonder what he looks like with his pants off. Mm -hmm. She likes his vest he's wearing. (laughs) She's wanting to see his very particular set of skills. Yep. (laughs) I I was saving that line for later. (laughs) The reason why Gina is there is because technically the B team is out in the van. They're listening in. They had gotten word. The B team had gotten word from Izzy that there was going to be an arms deal happening at this speech. That's why they're there. But Gina's totally distracted. We also see in the cutscenes that there's a masked man running into the building. Eventually, at the end of the speech, as Liam Neeson or Karun is out shaking hands in the audience and, and uh, asking for people to donate money to the cause. The masked man comes in, fires his automatic weapon, and somehow hits nobody. <laughs> I also want to point shot. out that while, while he's sneaking into the building, you know, the B team who's observing do, do a fantastic <laughs> job of not noticing him sneaking <laughs> with an automatic weapon. They can't do everything, John, okay? Can't expect miracles out of them. I mean, you know, if, if you're observing, I would think that you would at least kind of watch. <laughs> Were they in the bug van? Do they still have that? They're in a different van. So that's another continuity thing that will happen here. Is the bug van will make a comeback, but this van is a different van just for this one episode for some reason. They have a I different mean, van. They don't always use the bug van. Yeah. Maybe that's it, though. Maybe they were just, they were off their game. Not in the bug <laughs> van. Yeah. The windows are in a slightly different spot. <laughs> they tinted them from the inside. <laughs> <laughs> well, the masked man yells that he wants Karoon. Kar- Karun steps in front, and then at the last second, before the gunman can fire, Gina yells. I don't think she yells police. She just yells, drop the gun, right? No, I think she yells, police, drop your weapon. Okay, and then immediately fires, not giving him a chance to drop the weapon, shoots and kills him. (laughs) I'm not going to say anything. (laughs) I'm just going to not say anything. (laughs) They go running over to to the man who's been shot. They pull back the mask, and they realize he's just a kid. He's a very, very English man, and, but Irish just a kid. Oh, yeah, Irish, Irish man. Sorry, yeah, because he's part of the uh, yeah. provost. But just, I didn't think yeah, he looked like a kid. It's just up. me. I'm like, he looks like a pretty old kid. Like, <laughs> he's just a kid. He's like, he's- and then the opening credits run. And guys, we have a change to the opening credits, too. There's some new scenes in this opening credit. New season, new producer, new writers, new scenes. We get a new racing scene, a better flyover shot of downtown Miami. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> And Tubbs and Crockett on the boat to St. Andrews, where Tubbs is screaming his ass off. (laughs) Holding on for dear life. (laughs) I love when Tubbs rides in the boat. It's like my favorite thing ever because he's so uncomfortable. Because it's we've talked about it before, where it's like he gets in the boat, it's like, okay, we're gonna do this, and then Don Johnson gets on, like, okay, I'm gonna drive. He's like, wait, this guy's gonna drive? (laughs) No, no. (laughs) So I want to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about our guest star, Liam Neeson. So, obviously, you would know him from Taken and Phantom Menace, you know, the Star Wars prequels. I uh, love Actually. Schindler List. Oh, oh, love yeah. Actually. Yeah, love Actually. Uh, I actually, I'm embarrassed to admit I like that movie. <laughs> um, I know mostly as Ra's al Ghul in the Batman Begins movie. You know, mm-hmm. Or Dark Man, if you want to go old school. I, I think pretty much everyone knows who Liam Neeson is, so I was going to throw out a few, a couple facts you might not know. Just two of them. One, he was the amateur boxing champ of his youth club, so mm. just always been a badass. Yeah, yeah he actually <laughs> got some, uh, got a little boxing, you know. And then something just to blow your guy's mind, especially with the the new movie coming out. Michael Bay told his animators, he said this in an interview, he told his animators to use Neeson, his movements and stuff, to create the body language for Optimus Prime. What? What? Wow. Yeah. (laughs) So Optimus Prime, like in the Transformer movies, Michael Bay, like they're they're basing that on like like Liam Neeson. That's interesting because I only thing thing I picture now of Neeson is from from like Taken Three, where they have to do like nine cutaways to show him gingerly climbing over a fence. (laughs) Run all night. (laughs) Yeah, run all night. Remember that with the new uh, Transformers, Transformers movie coming out. And we are yeah. going to see it, so we will, <laughs> we will look for that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, 
that whole time you're watching it, just imagine Liam Neeson as Optimus Prime. <laughs> Does he do the voice for Optimus Prime? No. no. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, no. he does no. the voice of the he does the voice of the tree in a monster calls and so now i'm picturing the tree but as optimus prime (laughs) (laughs) no the voice of optimus prime and eeyore Uh and several of your other favorite animated characters is peter cullen yes He's done it. So he's done it since the beginning of Transformers. So yep. He's like really? eighty years old. But <laughs> yeah, yep. So if you ever watch Eeyore mm-hmm. and you just picture Optimus Prime, because that's what the, it's the same voice. Yep, it's the same <laughs> voice. Yep. So when we come back from the opening credits, we're at the precinct. They have no information on the shooter. They have no information on the gun deal. And we see, I this is like a quick scene where we find out Gina, she's really into Karoon. She gets a phone call to, that he wants to thank her for saving his life. We know where this is going. What we really want to talk about is the new Tubbs and Crockett. Can I just say that the, <laughs> this is where my first notes of the episode come in and it just says, oh, God, no one looks good. <laughs> but I did like asterisk it because I said like Tubbs, Tubbs put on those sweet glasses later and I said, OK, wait, <laughs> like Tubbs is the only one whose look may have improved. Are you kidding me? Look at Trudy rocking the pink with the yellow hoops. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> she looks like she Are should be in a Paula Abdul video, okay? <laughs> well, back then that would have been an Damn improvement right. of what she looked like before, though. <laughs> <That's the point. laughs> I'd be her cartoon cat. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, always. Tubbs always looks well put together. He's he's always got the nice suit on. He has he was letting his hair get a little crazy there in season two. Yeah, it was getting it's a been little cut bit. back. He's been cut back. <laughs> yeah. He's he's trimmed up. Sonny, on the other hand. He, I can't put my finger on what he looks like because he's he's obviously the same fashion. He's wearing the same pants, the same style of clothes. He's wearing he's got a little different haircut, but the darker tones of all the clothes, except for Trudy, but in the rest of the episode, all the darker tones, you know, because they've thrown out the rule that there's no earth tones in or no dark tones. That was a Michael Mann rule. It's it's a stark change. It kind of makes you feel like they're different characters too. I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> <laughs> Crockett's been hanging out with the old guys too uh, <laughs> playing yeah, checkers too much. <laughs> yeah. At the end of the precinct scene, Gina's off to go see Karoon, and we head over to Bunny's house. Now, Bunny is the rich businessman who has been housing Karoon in Miami, and so the B team is off to go see him and find out what's what's happening. And the last time that he's seen Karoon, and when they get there, Bunny says. I haven't seen him. He moved out. He doesn't live here anymore. Meanwhile, still wearing full clothes in the pool. I can't figure that out. Like, why was he sitting in the in like the pool, like a pool lounge chair in the pool with like a suit on <laughs> or like a dress shirt on and like chains? And everything? What the hell? <laughs> Bunny does what Bunny wants. Okay. Uh, yeah. Apparently, <laughs> Bunny just spent all morning in detention with some snot nosed kids, and Bunny was like, <laughs> yeah, he wants to relax. <laughs> have a drink and he don't have time to take off his nice fancy shirt <laughs> bunny says he doesn't know why the provost will want to kill karoon he's just he's not involved in any of it so he's just playing dumb to this we leave from bunny's house we head out to the street and this is where Tubbs and crockett they found out that the b team had gotten their information that the drug deal was going to happen at the at, at, not at, drug deal. At, i mean the gun deal at the gun opening. deal they got word that the b team had found out from izzy that the gun deal was going to happen at our open and so they ran off to go see Izzy and find out why they were why he gave the B team bad information. And they find Izzy walking down the street with several greyhounds <laughs> leaving from the track. <laughs> I really don't like this part. So <laughs> Mike, well, I'm not gonna say anything you know, about the funny. greyhounds. <laughs> what, what's funny about greyhounds is that the names of the greyhounds are actually referencing some novel I've never heard of. So uh, oh, the names he I've says. never heard of it. What novel? Yeah, the name he says. I don't know. I never heard of it, so I didn't write it down. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what it was, so I didn't care. <laughs> Izzy's got some story. He's there with Manny, too, by the way. Manny yep. looks fabulous. Yes. That hair. Yeah. That hair just keeps getting bigger. Damn it, Manny. Why are you uncredited? Who are you? I <laughs> must know. <laughs> John staying up at night trying to figure out who this man is. <laughs> John sketches of him. I'm calling <laughs> random Manny's in the phone book. Are you when- Manny? <laughs> <laughs> Izzy's got some crazy story about why he's got the dogs he's trying to cover up, but in reality, Tubbs and Crockett don't care. 
They just want to know who he got his information from about this gun deal. And he eventually gives up the name Max Kaiser. That's who he got the information from. But before we go meet Max for the first time, we get to see Gina and Karun walking down the beach on the Miami waterfront. And it appears that Karun has had some sort of problem with his shirt. Like it's lost <laughs> several buttons. <laughs> He's just blowing in the breeze. And all you see is Liam's Liam Neeson's a- nipples. <laughs> Liam's aiming to get some ass. Like this goes from a walk to a drink, to a dinner, to yeah. a back at my house. Yeah. He's working it. <laughs> Credit to Vice when it gets when I get sexy because you're right. They're on the beach, then there's dinner, and Gina dressed up right now. She's wearing gloves like the yeah, long, like the long arm black gloves. gloves. <laughs> and, yeah, they're having some drinks. Uh-huh. Then when we get to the sex scene, it is a very tasteful sex scene but it's compared steamy, to though. it is steamy. It is true. That's pretty. It's pretty hot for for network TV. TV but it's not foot rubbing, dripping, okay, we don't and sweat. Need to talk about sex that. scenes <laughs> like we've seen before in Miami Vice. It's not vomit <laughs> inducing. <laughs> I, I just I love the, that. The scene when they're there, like they're trying to have small talk before the the sexy time happens. <laughs> Canoodling. And, um, yeah, and, and, and Liam Neeson asks Gina, so what's it like being a cop? And I'm waiting for it to say, well, I pretend to be a hooker mostly. And- <laughs> I like being a hooker. Most of the time, that's what I do. Until that one time that I actually might have been a hooker momentarily. <laughs> we don't talk about that. I mostly blocked that out. The therapist says it's okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, I was a little concerned at Liam trying to eat her face. But I feel like the like See, like sexiness of kissing the, the, on this is just not where it needs to be. Sunny is maybe the only person that can pull off like a halfway decent kiss. Everyone else is just kind of frightening. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is I was going to use his uh, set of skills remark, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> Jenna had to go and take it right from you. Right off the bat. <laughs> so yeah, Nisa starts getting there with his with, with his move, you know, the Irish sexter. <laughs> <laughs> well, when Nisa's done giving Gina the mashed potato, we wake up the next morning. <laughs> we wake up the next morning and we're at the precinct. The duo are mentioning that they have set up a meeting with Kaiser. Crockett thinks that Karun has a lot to gain in this deal, so they were going to follow up on this. And in the middle of that, Castillo gets a call. It's a call that he's been expecting from a man named Richard Cross, who is ex-SAS commando. He's now in charge of counterterrorism for Scotland Yard. And he's got another presentation talking about how Sinfine, the provost, and IRA are kind of all involved. that, And they're all watching on this counter te- as part of the counterterrorist group for Scotland Yard. And that Karun, anyone that gets close to him, you can pretty much figure that they're dead and that's when and everyone knows especially trudy knows that that's where gina is right now she goes he, i she went, spent the night with him last night basically <laughs> and i haven't heard from her <laughs> all morning <laughs> tries, and tries to dial her right then I, I feel like this guy's trying too hard to be british like i almost expect him at one point to go like pip pip cheerio bob's your uncle <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you know pull out a cup of tea hold on wait a second <clears throat> Uh, but Melissa, I think you're right on. Like she just, they must have been sitting in front of a phone. Yeah, which she I thought was. was ridiculous. <laughs> now, I mean, we come back to the awkward, weird placement of the phone later on when Sunny answers it when they're in the conference <laughs> yeah, room as well. <laughs> like that phone gets a lot of use for it being in the middle of a conference room. And how does it ha- like the cord reach all those places where it's plugged into? It's right. like all over the place, like over here across the table, then over there across the table. Like, that has to be an OSHA hazard. Someone has to have tripped. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the duo head off. They're going to go talk to Kaiser. They head over to Kaiser's office and Kaiser greets them as Senor Burnett and Topo Manieri. Oh, a new name. Yeah, <laughs> Tubbs has a new name. He's he's not I, I, he's not Jamaican. I love it how Tubbs gets the new name, not Crockett, whose name has been burned at this point. Um, but Tubbs, he's the one that needs a new undercover ID. <laughs> So what's not, happening here is like that Tubbs has got pirates hunting him. <laughs> <laughs> Details here with the Kaiser meeting is that Burnett is himself. He's a deal, not necessarily a dealer. He sets up deals. His undercover role is always that's the character that he's created for it. For that's who Burnett is. It should also be noted that he's already worked with Max Kaiser mm-hmm. before, so yeah. they already know each other. 
Yeah. And what Topo Menieri is supposed to be <laughs> is someone who's buying some very big guns, mortars, M67s, M6, M14s. He wants some tomahawk, not tomahawk missiles, but he wants some side, like, um, like rocket launcher type stuff. Uh, so he wants some big, big things. All that he wrote down on a nice piece from his new journal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the Kaiser's, whole time, the German guy is sitting there stroking a cat. <laughs> <laughs> Which is interesting you say that because it turns out that the man who plays Kaiser was the main bad guy in all of the Bond movies from 1977 to 1986. So this is a big get for Miami Vice. Like yes. this is a big time movie star. He was in all the, all the Bond movies in that era. Kaiser, of course, is willing to set this deal up. He's going to take 10 points for the deal. He gives a name to go for Burnett to go see Eddie K. Alone. He is not to bring he Topo Manieri. He, he just writes an address down like, here, here you go, go see Billy. He's over <laughs> on Third Market. Oh. <laughs> Tell him Klaus sent you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've stopped over at Karun's house. We just see Gina and, and Karun canoodling together in the bed still. And then we also have another re re really fast scene where we see the B team who are still staking out Bunny and they're following their their mission is to follow him. He's driving in a nice brand new Lamborghini. So they can't or not, follow not, him. Not, not Lamborghini, but, but a Ferrari. Ferrari, yeah. And yeah, they can't and, keep up with him. Yeah, they can't keep up with him. The, I think this is the next day. The next day, Tubbs is waiting out at Gina's house and he's waiting for Gina to come home. Another fast scene here where he sees Gina walking Walking out, he runs over to tell her that, hey, Karun is no good. He's the counterterrorism unit at the Scotland Yard thinks that he's dangerous. And she's like, whatever. He's changed. I know him too well now. Don't you don't need to tell I me what, what to do. <laughs> <laughs> you can't tell me then different about him. And Melissa, this is where we confirm season three is different. We're under a new regime because Tubbs says, well, Crockett doesn't like this. And Gina's like, I don't give a what Crockett yeah, says. She makes it clear. She's like, oh, really? Well, he would be objective, wouldn't he? You know, like, uh, <laughs> I don't give a crap what he thinks about. This. this is it. This is the breakaway. There's no more Gina and there's and no Sunny. more in yep, Sunny and Gina. Done. That's done. There's, that's it. <laughs> really? Yeah, no, they don't, don't ever go back to that. <laughs> but they have a moment later. There's a there's a, there's a a connection and almost hug. <laughs> it's just a friendship. That's all that yes. ever yeah. stays with them is a friendship. It's always awkward, though, when they date new people, but it's still never, mm -hmm. they never get back together. <sighs> ever since Elvis ate her favorite purse. Uh, yeah, I know. Well, she gets for keeping kibble in it. <laughs> 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 Meanwhile, Sonny is out to go see Kay. Kay is like out in the middle of nowhere. It's like this old gas station has been turned into a bar. It's out in the glades. It, <laughs> he walks into the bar. There's a woman on the sw on a swing that then gets off and tries to pickpocket Sonny when he walks into the bar. The whole setup is it's actually really great because it plays into this uh, mi militant group that's out hidden away from from the city. Sonny tells him that Crockett, he wants Crockett Tully fit, fits in here too. I mean, like he orders a Zima. Perrier. <laughs> um... <laughs> <Harry. laughs> yes, yeah. he's like one of them old boys. <laughs> Sonny gives Kay the list. Kay's like, "I'm in," eat, but he does find out that the guns are for. Manieri, so for, for South African, which keeps coming up, and that's because it's from the rip from the headlines, Dick Wolf style. Because of in in this in 1986, the apartheid South Africa had put a um, like a moratorium on all journalism and press throughout the entire country in 1986. We're at the end; we're almost to, to the end of the apartheid, and so Dick Wolf has been working in the IRA, mm -hmm. and now South Africa and the apartheid they're working that into the storyline. So now we're going to have like three real fast scenes. One, at Bunny's place, Karun shows up and the B-team radios in to Trudy to say, hey, tell Tubbs and Crockett. <laughs> <laughs> Pass on the message, all right? <laughs> at lunch, at a separate place, at lunch, Castillo is with Cross and they're talking about the mission. This really doesn't have anything to do other than that Cross is adamant that these are irish terrorists here in miami and castillo's like just whatever just let us do our jobs back at bunnies they're walking along the beat the b team are trying to listen into their conversation they're having some radio issues it's it's a conversation that they actually don't need to to listen in on all that you get the sense of is where bunny's property is and where they're meeting but all that happens is is that bunny says he tells karoon that the provost know that he's in miami and karoon says they just don't understand what i'm trying to do 
it's bigger than what they it's bigger than blowing up uh trucks yeah it's bigger it's like bigger a bigger picture than they can ever imagine basically yeah and then an airplane flies by yeah and then it's pause mm-hmm. on an airplane flying mm-hmm. by <laughs> mm-hmm. hang with me here. snakes <laughs> <laughs> i have i have a plan <laughs> <laughs> at the precinct later it's more co- conversations with cross Cross is saying that Karun, like, don't tell Gina any of this information because Karun will pump the information out of her. The B team come in and say they got nothing on Bunny. They've been following him around all day. They can't keep up with them because he's in the Ferrari. And then the phone rings and it's Burnett that Kay is ready to sell the goods. And so this is when things start to get really good here. So who answers the phone with their whole name? Hi, it's Sunny Burnett. (laughs) Thank you for calling. It's Sunny Burnett. How can I help you? I I, I have a different problem with that. Like, did he just give them like, hey, here's the number to the station. (laughs) Dial extension 124. That's for Sunny's desk. (laughs) They have a separate number. That's why there's two phones in there. And that's why Vito's like, hey, it's the whatever they call it. They call it something else. It's the Mm -hmm. whatever phone. And so that he goes and picks it up. Yeah. It's like that's the number he gives out. Only, only the, they only they give just that have out. to answer it by three rings. Otherwise, it hits the switchboard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how does that work? Because he also has the phone on his boat and the phone in the car. And like, at what point, like, does he say you can call me on any of these three numbers, <laughs> <laughs> or does he have like call forwarding? <laughs> well, I don't that? think there was call forwarding back then, so I think he got like a car, business card that's got like nine numbers on it. <laughs> <laughs> sure, he's p- pretending to be an operator. I'm yeah. gonna catch you through. <laughs> so now we're gonna get good here, and this is—I mean, good as in like this one specific part that's really good here at Kleiser's office. Karun and Bunny are both there. They're saying they want—they were trying to buy weapons from Kleiser before. They want big stuff too. And Kleiser says, "Hey, there's been a rush. We're low on inventory." And Bunny says, well, "What if we double the price? We give a 100 percent markup." And Kleiser wasn't going to give in on him. He's like, okay, sure. He goes and calls K. K's in the Stuart, truck. How about a thousand percent? Here, <laughs> take all my money. <laughs> K, meanwhile, is in his truck. He's fast approaching his meeting with Manieri and Burnett. He's got his weapons. He finds out that they got a better deal. It's like, okay, I'll tell Burnett and Manieri, like, tough shit. You all were going to sell to, to these other buyers. So then they show up at, and this is the, the K buy. K's already there. He's got his truck. He's got the weapons laid out on the beach. Burnett or Sonny and Tubbs show up in the Ferrari and they're parked across the beach. And they see everything laid out. K says, get out of the car, walk over here. There's quite a gap between them. So they walk over. Sonny and Tubbs are looking through all the weapons and Sonny's very mad that one some of the stuff that they want isn't there and K just says we got a better buy like it tough just deal with it and two Sonny's really upset that the stuff is really old it's like seven years old and he doesn't want to buy he doesn't want to set his buy up with buying such old stuff he doesn't think that it's going to work anymore i love how Kay's like well you know uh, i can sell you some uh gas you know like <laughs> here's some mustard gas you can do, do that yeah he you tries know, to offer that, biological weapons and they're like no yeah, my thought my thought is like isn't this the time when you arrest this guy you know before he gives the weapons <laughs> to the bad guy <laughs> They're not here to do police work, John. That's not what this is about. <laughs> well, Kay is like, so you don't believe that these weapons are still good? He grabs a different rocket launcher, loads it up, turns and aims, fires, and blows the Ferrari, Crockett's prized Ferrari, <laughs> to smithereens. And Crockett just stares in awe at his car. You see the reflection of the explosion in his sunglasses as he slowly pulls them down. And all Tubbs does is says, We'll take it. He looks so happy about that. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm driving around that old ass convertible, and you're driving around in that car. Nope, not anymore. Oh yeah, you can see Tubbs had a big ass smile. Like, like hell yeah. <laughs> he never no, let I me got drive the that car. car. <laughs> <laughs> this also means that we're. That means in the next episode, we're getting the the um Testarossa. The Testarossa. The Miami Vice Testarossa that the show is really known for that I've been waiting to see when Sonny gets and how he gets that car. And I know there's some shady stuff that happens with that car too. Oh, I'm, so. no, there's nothing shady. I'm sure Sonny, I'm sure Sonny set someone up, landing <laughs> drugs on nope. someone to get you that. You guys are going to be utter, bitterly disappointed when you figure out that none of that happens. So, of course, 
after seeing his Ferrari get kerploded, <laughs> Tubbs and Crockett take off to go talk to Kleiser, and they muscle Kleiser into finding out who the other buyers were, and he eventually gives in, says that it was a man named oh, Karun. Because God. they smashed his trinkets. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All this is my statues. favorite. So, so what? Crockett's like, you know, big man, I'm going to go complain to the German guy. And they get him to talk because they start breaking his figurine collection. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you better talk. Oh, oh, there goes, there goes the elephant figurine. Punch. <laughs> the kitten's going next. <laughs> <laughs> so now they head back to the precinct and they have, they kind of have a little bit of the puzzle here. They know that. Bunny and Karun are in cahoots. They know that they're trying to buy very large weapons. And they eventually talk it out at the precinct to put together that their plan is because of the path that where Bunny's house is and the Miami International Airport that they will shoot down the Concorde jet that flies between Miami and London and cross. I guess very hell- being in flight attendance pays off. <laughs> cross points out he's like the concord is as recognizable as the queen <laughs> and this is where i was like okay this took the story kind of took a turn i wasn't expecting that that's what they're here to do shoot down i mean they could have done that from london <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> <laughs> no a whole bunch of them from london <laughs> what they were saying is that they were trying to bring attention like the american's attention to it Okay, so there'd be a terrorist act on yep. American soil, yep. but against English yeah. people. Yeah. Gotcha. And, and Sonny's kind of nice to Gina about it. Like, he's not going to rub it in. He kind of puts his arm around her and like, hey, I got some rebound D for you if you need it. <laughs> 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 Gina is obviously in shock. She's in on the conversations now. They've because now they've busted this thing wide open. So now we're gonna go. The next day is when the bus can happen because they put together that the next Concorde jet is flying out 10 a.m. the next day, and that that's when this is supposed to happen. Real fast, there's a scene at Caroons where Gina's preoccupied and. She says, I'm, I'm going to be alone tonight. And Karun says, okay, fine. I have a 1030 appointment tomorrow, but how about lunch? Yeah, and she's like shocked. <laughs> oh, like, <no. gasps> Karun's trying to show her his Barney bone. <laughs> <laughs> Cross, meanwhile, he's like pounding whiskey in his hotel room and then decides to call Karun and say they know about the beach and then hangs up. Yeah. That limey wanker. He is setting it up because he wants it to happen. Also, he wants the plane to be blown up so that they have ammunition to go and kill all these people for the mm-hmm. IRA. Yeah, now they, they have complete, they can go and make a big show of it. Yeah. So this is both parties wanting, wanting Karun to go through with this. Yes. So the next day, here we go. We're on the final scene. This is the bus. Now this takes place over a couple different areas, but it's the final scene. We're in the bus here. The whole team, helicopter, Tubbs in the convertible, the B team, they're all following Bunny. And he's going to a parking garage. Now, Trudy and Gina, they've been benched. Gina specifically has been told not to be a part of this. She's in surveillance, not out in the field because she can't be trusted. Yeah. Castillo has to play it safe here and make sure that she hasn't but been Trudy gets by punished. <laughs> <laughs> Trudy, Trudy's yeah. doing what Trudy does. <laughs> yeah. She's Trudy's right like, what the hell? She's right I'm not on the one that I couldn't keep my pants on. <laughs> so Karun and Bunny go to the parking garage in their van. There's a weapon exchange, but Bunny and Kay get in the van and leave while Karun stays. And they did a missile launcher swap in the parking garage. Where do you get a bag like that? <laughs> do they make missile launcher <laughs> bags that you can put over your shoulder to carry it around? It's, it's like, even on Amazon Prime. Like you can get it next day. <laughs> rocket launcher duff, duffel bag. <laughs> I so bet you weird ten dollars if we look that up, we would find one. You probably. <laughs> <laughs> so this is weird to me. So Bunny and Kay leave the garage in the van, and they're like, "No, no, don't bust them. Let's follow them. Let's let him get as close to blowing up the plane as possible. Continue yeah. following them." Yeah, they follow. And then no one, no one checks the parking garage they do after check- they leave. Yeah, so so they do. The they B do. team goes in and yeah. checks them, but they get they get beat up by, by Karun yeah. and ties them up and leaves them inside of the van. Well, I think they tied each other up. Now, <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, the helicopter tubs and the and all the surveillance goes and follows Bunny and Kay down to the beach. There's a shootout. They decide instead of just being the distraction, they actually get in a shootout. With the police that fault with the Miami PD as they go in for the bus, Castillo, like a 
Champ shoots K right in the forehead from I the know. helicopter. <laughs> Such a G. <laughs> <laughs> shoots him. Well, you, know, you, you say that that's the shootout's kind of Castillo's fault. Crockett and Tubbs are way back behind them in the car. They just kind of fly the helicopter in, and he just gets on the ball horn like, "Don't move, Miami PD. We're gonna land here in a few minutes. Don't go anywhere." <laughs> <laughs> a little premature, Castillo. Like, like well, I mean, wait till you get a little closer. He had the gun, so I think he thought that that's what he was doing. Like, don't move or I'll shoot you. And then he shot them. <laughs> so I think his whole plan was just, to shoot them all what along. I said. Why didn't they listen to what I say? <laughs> exactly. I, I guess you're right. I just, I figured, you know, catching them alive first is probably the first priority. Using your, never mind. I, I guess shoot first, <laughs> ask questions later. They run over to the van. They open up the case. The missile launcher is gone. So now that means that Karun and Karun's not there either. So Karun and a rocket launcher are gone. He must be back at the parking garage. And so now they're all going to race back to the parking garage before he can shoot down the concrete because he's going to exactly shoot it from the air. He's going to shoot it while still on the tarmac at the Miami airport. So they go racing back. Gina leaves the surveillance area. She's like, I know where he is. I'm going to go see if I can bust him. They all race over there. Gina gets there first. Karun is up on the rooftop of the parking garage. He's lo- looking over the airport. Conveniently, he looks at where the Concorde jets park. He's slowly getting ready. He's pretty feeling pretty good. Like he's got a good shot lined up here. Gina pops out from behind him, very upset. Like, hey, please don't make me kill you. Did you mention that that they end up arresting the English guy? Oh no, I missed. I skipped over across that they do. But that that's when they go back to him, though. That's not at that scene. In right? the process of this, there is a, a moment where Trudy calls into Castillo and says, we got the phone records and we yeah. see that one person that called Karun was from Cross's hotel room. And so then Castillo goes over and places Cross under arrest. Yeah. So then at the parking garage, Gina's pleading with Karun, please don't make me shoot you. Just give yourself up. It's not too late to stop here. He turns around slowly starts to pull a gun out of his waistband, but she can't see him as he's doing it. And at the last second, Sonny comes rolling out from a, from a different corner. As Karun turns around, Sonny and Gina both shoot. Karun gets shot multiple times in the chest, falls over the railing to his death at the bottom of the parking garage. Crockett grabs Gina, embraces her, freeze frame, episode over. You like how he fell on the stop? Uh, yeah, well, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, that's Dick Wolf, right? That's got to be like mm-hmm. that, uh, the dun, symbolism dun. starting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I just like to see Gina and Crockett doing things together as a couple again. <laughs> <laughs> so I have many thoughts about this episode, but we'll save them for our final thoughts. Let's get over and go talk about the music in this episode. All right, John, it did sound like the music had taken at least there wasn't the normal cast of characters like Oingo Boingo and Phil Collins. No, Oingo Boingo. (laughs) (laughs) What do you got for us this week, John? All right. So I'm going to run through this thing backwards. We're going to start with Wildcats of Kilkenny by the Pogues, who were a Celtic punk band. Their music was politically tinged with a punk style while using traditional Irish in- instruments like the tin whistle, banjo, <laughs> the sit-turn, the mandolin, and the accordion. So, and I didn't realize the banjo or the mandolin were Irish, but... <laughs> Thanks, Wikipedia. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, and they've been said to have been the influence for bands like Flog and Molly and the Dropkick Murphys. Here's the fun part about this band. So the band, they formed when future members Shane McGowan and Peter Spider Stacy met while in the toilets at a Ramones gig in 1977. <laughs> <laughs> yep, met in the bathroom. They uh, started a band called the Millwall Chainsaws, and then they changed their name a couple times, started to get noticed as the Pogues Mahone while, while they were playing the pubs and clubs in London in 1984. And they got noticed by Stiff Records and got a record deal. They dropped Mahone and just went by the Pogues. They released several albums throughout the 80s, got some attention, mostly with the help of Elvis Costello, who helped produce some of their work. They wouldn't really go mainstream until they released a Christmas hit duet with Christy <laughs> McCall called Fairy Tale New York in 1987. Like, that was their moment. 
you laugh, but it was their moment because I, I want to say in like 2000 they re released it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they continued to release albums and they had some commercial success through the early to mid 90s until they called it quits in 96. And then eventually they would reunite from 2001 to 2014, but mostly opening shows for Dropkick Murphys and bands like that. Mm. So that brings us to our next song, The Last Unbroken Heart by Patti LaBelle and Bill Ch- Champlin. I mean, Patti LaBelle, I don't know why there's not a Patti LaBelle biopic at this point. She's a career spanned 50 years and selling over 50 million records outside of her outstanding music career she has been an act she, she was an actress in the movie uh a soldier's story she was on tv shows a different world she was recently on american horror story Freak show she had her own sitcom in, in uh 92 called out all night really yeah she had her own sitcom yeah. Her wow. own sitcom. Yeah. She she has a reality show right now called Living It Up with Patty LaBelle. She was on 2015's Dancing with the Stars. That's all outside of her music career, which, you know, started when she was the front woman of Patty LaBelle and the Bluebells in the 60s. They were the first African American group, not female group, first African American group to make it onto the cover of Rolling Stone. Wow. Dang. Yeah, yeah. So she ended up going solo in, uh, when the band split in 76. She really hit it big from about 1984 into the early 90s. It was a number one album in 1986. She won a few Grammys in 92 and 90. Like I said, uh, there should be like a biopic. Read some of the stories. Uh, back in the 60s, she was assaulted by soul singer Jackie Wilson or... At one point in time, she was engaged to Otis William of The Temptations. Wow. Yeah. When you think about how much stuff Patti LaBelle has been involved with and how there hasn't been more information about her, like, especially in comparison to people from that generation, like you're saying, she's in a re- reality show right now. She was in yeah. Dancing with the Stars last season. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> she, yeah, she is still relevant. Is still very relevant. She made headlines in 2015 after a vlogger spoke highly of her brand of sweet potato pies. It caused such an uproar that Walmart was selling a pie every second. <laughs> yeah, wow. she ran out of them. She didn't have enough. They couldn't produce enough pies. There was like a shortage of it. I remember that part. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I don't know. Uh, someone needs to make a movie. I am going to mention Bill Champlin a little bit. Uh, he was born in Oakland, American singer, guitarist, and keyboardist. Most known for being associated with the band Chicago and his own band, the Sons of Champlin. Champlin's high school band, The Opposite Sixth, would eventually change their name to the Sons of Champlin uh, and record a number of well-reviewed but poor-selling albums. He would eventually move to L.A. in 1977 at about uh, at 30 years old and begin a solo career, which went quite a bit better. He writes songs and do backing vocals for various artists. He worked with Earth, Wind, Fire, Argo Speedwagon, Toto. In 1978, one day after Chicago's guitarist Terry Kath died, Champlin would actually get offered the job to replace him as the guitarist, but he actually turned it down. And then a few years later in 1981, after working with uh, Chicago's drummer, Danny Seraphine, uh, Seraphine, he'd actually start contributing with the band Chicago and just pretty much been been a part of Chicago ever since. That leads us to first or last artist of the music, Imagine by John Lennon. So and I wanted to save Lennon for last because, I mean, obviously, John frickin' Lennon. And he got his start in 1957 with the group The Quarrymen, who would become the Silver Beatles and then eventually just the Beatles. Really? I don't know. I've never heard of them. Who are these the Beatles? <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. They were really the Silver Beatles. Kinda, the Silver Beatles. The yeah. Silver the Beatles. The Horsemen first. Actually, John Lennon and uh, Paul McCartney met at Lennon's second performance with the Quarrymen, and they would uh, and basically joined the band. And then a little bit later, Paul would recommend guitarist George Harrison, who was 14 at the time. Uh, he'd recommend him to John Lennon and. First, Lennon, he was like, he's too young. But then they let him audition, and then George Harrison joined the band. And then, and this is the other part, at the time, 
Stuart Sutcliffe, when they first became the actual Beatles, Stuart Sutcliffe was their bassist and Best was their drummer. No Ringo yet. <laughs> so obviously, eventually, Paul would take over playing bass for Sutcliffe and they would eventually replace Pete Best with Ringo Starr. It's the freaking Beatles. They, they achieved success in 1963. They're on the Ed Sullivan show in 64. They were bigger than Jesus, which actually helped contribute to them stop touring in 67 and then that same year their manager would die brian epstein so because of lack of touring their manager dying and uh john lennon getting into heavily into uh lsd uh, the <laughs> beatles would break up the uh, band would disband in 1970 john would focus on his music with his wife yoko uno who married in 1969 he had a pretty good solo career uh i want to say he sold 14 million records as of 2012, mm. but he's responsible for 25 number one singles because he was also writing people's songs, writing songs for people too. Something you might not know is that he moved to New York in 1971 and Richard Nixon spent considerable amount of time trying to deport Lennon because of his <laughs> anti-Vietnam way statements and stuff. <laughs> yeah, dude, he tried to deport him from 71 to 76. It finally got resolved. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't work. <laughs> December 8th, 1980. John Lennon was returning home with his wife, Yoko, when Mark David Chapman shot Lennon four times in the back. Lennon would be pronounced dead upon arrival at the hospital. And what is crazy about this is that earlier that evening, Lennon signed an autographed copy of his album, Double Fantasy, which he had just released uh, about three weeks earlier. He signed that copy for Chapman. In fact, mm. I, I think there's actually a picture that someone, a photographer took of him signing the album and, with, and handing it to Mark David Chapman. Yikes. Yeah. And dude, just as recently as 2016, Mark David Chapman was denied parole for the ninth time. In 2018, he will be up for parole again. He was sentenced. He, he pled guilty to second degree murder and got 20 years to life. Then there's that whole catcher in the rye thing with he said that he did it because of all the phony and it, that whole thing played a part. But what's kind of crazy is that Chapman's hit list included David Bowie, Johnny Carson, Marlon Brando, Walter Cronkite, Elizabeth Taylor, George C. Scott, and Jackie O. But Lennon was the easiest to access. And that's why he went after him first. So he basically made a list of all the most popular people in the world at the time. That were against war. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, those are those, that's what was. There is your music. This is a. I guess it's not a different music. It's hard to gauge right now what the music is going to be because we know coming up that it's going to be more more rock and more metal type music, and so it's hard to gauge right now because they did work in some Irish music here. So it's hard to gauge right now if it's for the episode. So I guess we'll find out later. But I'm sure we're happy to hear that we're not using recycling some of the previous artists. Now we're getting new artists, which is which is good news. Yeah, we're, we're, we're getting new artists. The only thing that makes me a little nervous is that they're big name artists. And so <laughs> I, I'm true. I, they may I'm not hoping be going we even to the well. Uh, I'm hoping we, we still get a couple Oingo Boingos, uh, you know, <laughs> or, or an occasional uh, Red Rider in there or something, you know, yep. but we'll see. Well, let's go talk about our final thoughts on this episode. All right, Jenna. Why don't you kick us off this week on what your final thoughts are on this season three, episode one of Miami Vice, When Irish Eyes Are Crying. Uh, I mean, I thought it was a pretty good episode, pretty decent episode to return to. And I don't know if it's just like looking back more fondly um, <laughs> on the season that I watched uh, more consecutively with you all. But I thought this one was good. I'm also a big dick wolf fan so i feel like that probably play at least somewhat into it like the rip from the headlines type style and i love liam neeson um <laughs> so i i do i wish a little i wish that there was a little bit more silliness but i know that that's sort of not the tone that they're taking anymore mm -hmm. which is unfortunate so like the car blowing up was probably probably like, I would agree with you. It was like the top scene for me because that was sort of as close as we kind of got to this to the silliness aspect. I don't know. I mean, it was it was good. No, uh, no fill the shill, but it was good. <laughs> John, what what are your final thoughts on this episode? I think it was a, definitely a strong start to season three. 
You know, we got a good guest star. We got some good music. Gina got laid. Like, <laughs> everybody's happy. Action. <laughs> uh, I'm digging it. Uh, you know, um, I'm excited now for season three. Excited to get in and see what, what we're in store for. I am still bothered by the fact that Manny, Izzy's buddy, <laughs> is still uncredited. <laughs> like, someone's got to know who the hell this guy is. Like, like this is... <laughs> I feel like every episode I see him and I'm watching the credits, you know, and I'm like pausing every other name. <laughs> He's got to be in here. Well, Molson, what are your final thoughts on this episode? I know I, you're a big fan of this one. I like this episode. I mean, I, obviously, I love this episode and I'm very excited to be in season three. I have been waiting for season three very patiently. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I like Liam Neeson in this episode. I think obviously because I'm Irish, it speaks to me a little bit more than maybe mm-hmm. everyone else, but hits you a little bit there. But I like it and I think that it is it is foreshadowing some stuff that's going to happen in season three the outfits definitely change the the short sunny haircut that he's got mm-hmm. going on <laughs> is definitely different and of course there's tubs with his, his glasses but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's more serious it definitely was more serious and i know ne- i never liked the silliness so i'm mm-hmm. perfectly fine without the silliness <laughs> <laughs> well i'll finish off the final thoughts here because i have I have a bit of conspiracy bacon, you might call it, (laughs) sizzling away in the pan. (laughs) I'm going to give season three more credit than than maybe what, because this this may not have been planned, but it it may be, and that might be why we have this sudden tone change, too. So, one, my advice is now scheduled in the same time slot as Dallas. And so Dallas is actually more like a soap opera than it is a nightly or a weekly uh, sitcom style. It's a soap opera. And so they're going up head to head against that. So I'm anticipating more soap opera-y storylines. But also, we're in season three of some vice cops that have seen some shit, like some really bad stuff. And I wouldn't doubt for a second that Dick Wolf has taken this opportunity to take season three and show that the vice team is becoming more grizzled. They're becoming more worn down. The the work of being a police officer of everyone that you've ever been close to being killed or being dirty or you have to arrest them or they flee because they they can't handle the pressure that that's starting to wear on them and that maybe by chance that the writers and the new producer of the show recognize that as the show develops our characters should develop and not always be the slapstick and the 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 um believe what everyone has to say that eventually they become they become worn down and that the work of being a police officer eventually gets to them and we're starting to see it just a little bit right now because they're less trustworthy of their sources and they're more quick to flip the switch and be angry at their at Izzy or someone like that. So does not say that this is true, but man, if it is, well played Dick Wolf and well played Miami Vice. Because you're developing your characters into this season and making them worn down and feeling the brutal work that is being a vice police officer, especially in the area that is referred to as as during the era of cocaine cowboys, that the crazy stuff that they've seen. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. That's definitely what's going on. (laughs) And it was nice, like the when they would touch earlier on like Sonny getting more in that dark side. So if that's more closely to like what season three ends up developing into that'd be good yeah so i i think it's gonna get there but then the by end of season four things are get silly again because they just they're trying they're trying to get ratings it gets real silly <laughs> <laughs> not gonna lie it's really 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 silly <laughs> but but i agree with you guys we're off to a great start i really like this episode uh liam neeson was great the story was great Gina having to be a Gina centric story was great. So I got nothing to complain about. And that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Jenna, thanks for coming back to Go With The Heat. We always enjoy you on the show. Thanks for having me. We would love to hear from you. So email us, goalwiththeheat at gmail.com or go to our website, goalwiththeheat.com. Click on About Us. You can find all the ways to contact us. Let me know in particular what you think of my theory that perhaps the show has undertaken understanding that the tone and the character stories should be changing as the characters get older in their careers on Miami Vice. So let me know. I'd love to hear from you. Go with the gmail.com. Did you know that you can find the show on YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play? You can pretty much find us anywhere you can find podcasts. And make sure on that podcast platform that you like to use, give us a review. We, In fact, we'd love you for, to give us a five-star review on whatever your platform of choice is. It'll help 
other people find the show. We appreciate you listening. And we Even love the harmony. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you. We Just thank you for right people. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you. We thank you for listening. Be sure to check out the website, and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pals.